day, everybody. This is Juanita Cap from Meticulous Moments. I'm streaming from South Africa, and I am here with your favorite mental patient. He goes by the name of Psycho Joe. Joe Mack is with Rock Solid Combat Sports and, of course, the Intensity Fighting Gym. Welcome, Joe. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, Juanita. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. It's an honor. It's an honor to have you. And you know what I love about you, Joe, is that energy that you have. You have energy. You are positive. You're always on the go. You know, even when we were trying to get on here, we just went, went, went. And I love that about you. And I know it's going to be a very energized, very powerful session. So let's talk boxing. I mean, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I got started boxing when I was five years old. My father was a fighter. His father was a fighter. My, my dad was a cop and I had three younger brothers. So he was like, you're the oldest of four boys. You're going to be in fights. So he started teaching me to box when I was five. I started competing when I was 10 with the Police Athletic League. I was a good boxer. I wasn't a great boxer, but I had learned about enough that I thought I was a really tough guy. And I was at the boys club in Nashville when I was about 11 or 12 years old and they were yeah. they were boxing and i went in there and unbeknownst to me it was billy ray collins whom was one of the greatest boxers that ever came out of me. and there his dad billy ray collins senior was his trainer he went by memphis billy ray because he fought out of memphis back in the 60s and 70s so when we got in there out of me like it was two rounds and it was over and i went home i had a black eye my nose was busted my lip was fat my mother said you're never going back to the boys club my dad said come here what happened i said i got in there with this guy and he tore me up he says go back tomorrow and tell him you want some more and that's what i did yes. and so mr collins is like what are you doing here you're never supposed to come back after a beating like that i was like i want to learn to do what he did to me i want to learn how to do it to somebody else and so that's how i met billy ray collins and Billy Ray became a seminal moment in, in my life through boxing because June 16th, 1983, Madison Square Garden, on the undercard of the Roberto Duran Davy Moore fight for the junior middleweight title. And coincidentally, June 16th was Roberto Duran's birthday. Billy Ray oh. Collins was the co main event against Luis Resto. He beats Luis mm -hmm. Resto, he gets the winner of the Duran Davy Moore fight. Yeah. So unbeknownst unbeknownst to his father, to anybody on our team, we didn't know, but and it's very well documented. They made a, a they made a movie about it um called Cornered. Um they had taken Carlos Panama Lewis to before he was before he was gloved up. When they came back in the room, he was gloved up. What we know happened now, we didn't know it then, but back back in the early 80s, Juanita, they, they didn't use padding, they used horse hair. So horse hair mm -hmm. compressed down about the, the front of the gloves. Yeah. The inside of the glove and pulled most of that horse hair out. The thing about the horse hair padding, it was still expanded, the glove still looked full unless you did it like this and it collapsed into knuckles so after the yeah. the second round billy told his dad he said uh dad this guy's hit me this guy's hit me with a brick i've never been hit this hard oh and uh so his dad said what do you want to do he goes oh i can knock him out he's there to be knocked out but i don't know what's going on this guy's hitting me really 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 hard so the fight goes on uh jake lamada and his wife were calling the fight this was on abc wild world of sports and Billy took a frightful beating. And to put it in perspective, and I tell people this, because this, this, I was 19 years old. This was June 16th, 1983. I just turned 19 in May. And I remember yeah. watching it on TV. I didn't get to go to New York with them. And I was crying. I was crying. I remember my stepmother, um, I remember she was saying, I knew he wasn't as good as y'all said he was, blah, blah, blah. Well, the analogy I use for people to understand 
what that fight was like. It's like if I were going to fight another guy that's equal to me, but I gave him a pillow for a weapon and I've got a Louisville slugger. That's how even it was. But to his credit, Billy never went down. He didn't bust open. He swolled up, though. Oh, my God. His head looked like a pumpkin after the fight. And at the, in the 10th round, the last 30 seconds of the round, he's standing ring center with Luis Resto going toe to toe, bang for bang. And he ends up losing yeah. a unanimous decision. Before the fight, Panama Lewis is yelling because we were undefeated. We were ranked in the top 10. We were undefeated. Uh, Irish Billy Collins was fixing to be the next big thing. And Panama Lewis was screaming across the ring. You're going down, Collins. You're going down. Well, what came out in the subsequent trials and everything, Panama Lewis made a deal in Miami with these Coke dealers and guaranteed him that Resto would beat Collins. So there was a bunch of money in this. So in any of this stuff where corruption's involved, all you got to do is FTM, follow the money, and you'll get to the root of all the problems. Billy died nine months later in a one-car accident in March 7th, 1984, on a road that I've been with him a million times. And he, he uh, I don't think he was trying to kill himself. I just think he was very angry. And he ended up crashing his car into a concrete embutment doing about 100 miles an hour, and it killed him. And this trial went on and on and on. And at the, and the, at the end of the day, a, a, a federal judge did a bench trial because they had two jury trials, and there was a juror hang, hold out that didn't want to convict. So they ended up putting Resto and Panama Lewis in prison for a couple of years, but the civil trial was dismissed for lack of evidence. Mr. Collins died a broken heart, a broken man. Billy was his guy, and he was going to be a world champion. So for me, that moment right there, I was like, I got to do something to help the fighters. So I got involved in professional boxing and promotions, and I was boxing mm -hmm. as an amateur, and I was bare knuckle fighting underground. So when yeah. I got in, when I got into professional boxing, I knew it was a little dirty. I didn't know it was as bad as it is. It's really, really professional boxing. It's almost as bad as when Blinky Palmero ran it with the uh, International Boxing Commission back in the 50s, where they made the great Jake LaMotta throw a fight against this fighter named Fox so he could get a title shot against Sugar Ray Robinson. So the politics of glove boxing and with what happened with Billy made me realize that the gloves are actually a hindrance. Bare knuckle mm. is the truth. This is the kind of fighting that you can't really cheat at unless you eye gouge, and that's obviously seen now. But yeah. that moment, June 16th, 1983, lives with me. I, I think of Billy every day and how different our lives would have been because he was like, Joe Mack, I'm going to knock him out, and you're going to be the mouthpiece. <laughs> and I said, perfect match. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I hear you. I definitely hear you. And, you know, um, we had this discussion, but for the sake of the audience, because I absolutely love learning about the sport and, you know, the differences between sports. And I hear you. My heart is very sad that he, that he died that way. And, you know, bless him and his family. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. We don't understand why these things happen. Let's talk. Let's talk about the difference between boxing and bare knuckle boxing because, you know, um, there's differences, of course, with the gloves, but there's also other rules that apply and in the size of the ring. We talked about that as well. Let's talk a little bit about that so that people in the audience can get a little bit of more information should they uh, not know the details already. I, I find it very, very interesting, the facts that you've, that you've shared with me before. Well, there's basically three fighting surfaces right now for bare knuckle. The first one is the Trigon, which is Backyard Brawls, BYB Extreme Fighting Series. It is the smallest fighting surface in all of combat sports. It is a Trigon with 60 degree corners. The other surface mm -hmm. is by BKFC, Barbecue Kentucky Fried Chicken Fighting. They have what's called the squared circle. That thing is huge. It looks like a big old swimming pool, but it's round. And then you have BK, BKB Trademark over in the UK. They use a standard square boxing ring. So mm -hmm. with Bare Knuckle, we have right now, and then Valor BK, which is headed up by Ken Shamrock, he has what they call the pit, and it looks like a big dish. I'm not personally not a fan because there's no ropes to be able to pin your opponent against. You can actually go mm -hmm. up the sides of the dish, and then if you both get past this line, you've got to bring them back down. 
not knocking Ken Shamrock. Love him. He's a legend, and I hope he does really well. I hope everybody in Bare Knuckle does well because this wave is still cresting out in the ocean. It has not even hit the shore yet. So the three surfaces out of the three, the trigon, the squared circle, and then a, a standard boxing ring or the four surfaces and then the pit. Of course, my favorite yeah. is the yeah. trigon because it forces mm -hmm. the action. BYB yes. has about an 80 to 90 percent knockout ratio because of it. And let's face it, 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 it was kind of like when we were trying to get this, when, it, when we were trying to get this legalized, our yeah. argument was this is stand up fighting. It's boxing without gloves, but the difference in bare knuckle is you can dirty box. In other words, I can hook my opponent, opponent and hit him with my free hand, and they can do the same thing to me. You can't hip toss. You can't use elbows. You can't use back fist. You can't throw somebody to the ground. You can't use your knees. So our argument was the whole time, the UFC, love them. Thank God for them. In 93, when they launched in Denver, that was a great thing. It opened up the door for all kinds of combat sports. But we're not dropping knees on somebody. We're not We're not taking them to the ground and choking them unconscious. We're not kicking them in the head. Yeah. We're fighting. And for most men and most, most people, if you're going to get into a fight in the street, defending your family or whatever it may be, it's going to be a stand-up fight for the most part, unless you fight a a trained MMA fighter, which those guys, in my opinion, are the most dangerous fighters in the world. My very good friend, <laughs> Shannon McCannon Rich, eight-time MMA world champion. That guy's 53 years old, and he can kick me right upside my head. He's got such – so for <laughs> for the sport of bare knuckle, the sport of bare knuckle, the Trigon is the most exciting, and it's, it's the – smallest surface and it forces the action and with those 60 degree corners it's so tight in a boxing ring you've got 45 degrees you can slide out mm -hmm. but in those 60 degree mm -hmm. corners if you get trapped in that corner you've got two directions you're going to go in you're either going to fight forward or you're going to get knocked down it's that simple <laughs> thank you for explaining that i agree i agree with you you know the mma when um when the ufc started absolutely amazing change in history I've, i watch mma frequently i love the preacher's daughter you know holly Holm. i love watching her i love watching ronda rousey um yes. i love one of the i couldn't, MMA I couldn't I, let me let me jump in let me jump in i could not believe it when holly Holm destroyed ronda yes. rousey she destroyed her oh my god and then ronda went to pro wrestling and made yes. a bunch of money but i was a big fan but if you'll remember yeah. People started saying, oh, Ronda Rousey could beat Floyd Mayweather. And I was like, y'all got to slow down. If she got into a boxing room with Floyd Mayweather, he'd make her look like a fool. <laughs> Everybody no, got that, a little carried away true. with that. Yeah, everybody's got their, uh, you know, the sports that they love. And I, I understand that there's a difference between boxing and MMA and bare knuckle boxing. So... You know, I, I often watch these matches that they put on um, YouTube, for instance, for people, the, between people that are jiu-jitsu fighters and some are taekwondo. And really, mm -hmm. I, I, sometimes I feel, you know, that's not really fair um, because they have different styles. But if you want to go into the freestyle, of course, we can we can do that. But the results are sometimes very surprising. Now, when Holly Holm uh, kicked Ronda Rousey and she won the title, Ooh. I was completely baffled. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, you know, I love both of them. They're amazing. I also like Drikas still knocks to Plessis from South Africa. Look, uh, keep a watch out for him. He's amazing. He's climbing the ranks. But, you know, when we talk UFC, MMA, to all sport, I believe, and you touched on that, there's an underbelly to the sport, right? I believe that, unfortunately, there are some things out there that we don't always agree with. And I, I really made a note in my mind when you and I, you spoke about Floyd Mayweather. When you and I had a virtual coffee, you made a comment that stuck with me. It was an exceptionally well-phrased comment. You said, for every Floyd Mayweather, there are 10,000 other boxers out there that want to make it, that want to get into the scene, into the ring. Tell us a little bit more about that so that the audience can get, you know, they can grasp really how tough it is to make it in the boxing world, in the UFC world, you know, as athletes. Point of that comment, and, and because 
the sport, everybody sees the superstars. They don't see that are trying to make it coming up that are working two jobs and training at night and raising a family and, and mm -hmm. trying to make it because they truly have the warrior heart. But for every, like I said, for every Floyd May Mayweather, there's 10,000 other fighters that are trying to make it. But guys like yeah. Floyd Mayweather show you that it's possible. Guys mm -hmm. like Oscar De La Hoya show you that it's possible. Yeah. The thing about yeah. boxing, though, I love boxing is my first love because I was a boxer first before I got involved in bare knuckle. I never was an MMA fighter. Um, I took uh, Rusty Gray's uh, Kung Fu class one time, and I just wasn't comfortable because I'd been boxing so long. I wasn't comfortable getting my feet off the ground. So I like being stand up. But the most yeah. dangerous fighters on the planet are the mixed martial artists because they're grapplers, they're strikers. They've got Muay Thai. They've got the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, they've got the boxing background. And just like my good friend, Mark Cole was an all state wrestler, heavyweight champion. I just want to throw a little shout out to him. About a year and a half ago, he got completely sober. He was on his deathbed. He has now transformed his life and his body. And I'm very proud of Mark Coleman every day for what he's done to improve his life, to improve his health. And you should see him now. He looks almost like he did when he was fighting in the UFC. It's crazy. And he's my age. He's in his 50s. Wow. I'm so proud of him and shout out to him. Thank God that he made that decision, that he made that choice. Uh, you know, yes, it takes a warrior's heart, definitely, in any of these fields, boxing, being a knuckle boxing, doing karate, doing MMA. You said something, uh, you know, you and, and I see that with you, Joe, and that's why you inspire us. You always come back. You know, you, you always get up and you made a comment the other day and I love that. I actually love that I used it in a phrase, in an email. You said, keep swinging and never give up. I love that about no, keep, you. Keep, so, no, it's no, keep so swinging, you. keep swinging and never surrender. That is our mantra. Keep Whether it's life, never whether, keep never swinging and never surrender. Surrender is never an option. When you surrender, you've lost. But we always keep swinging. That's it. My That's father it. used to tell me, I don't care if the blood is filling up your shoes, you continue to fight. Because if you quit and you come home, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> I love that. That was the truth. You, you. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely fabulous. And, you know, Joe, lessons that we learn, uh, uh, you know, along our life, along the road that we walk, our journey, what, was there a time in your life that you felt that you wanted to stop swinging, that you maybe wanted to surrender, or did you never have those thoughts? Did you never have those darker times? Was it, what was that like for you? Well, we've, we've all had those moments, I think. And, and I have, of course, been in my life a few times where you start yeah. questioning yourself, start thinking that maybe you're not on the right path or, I mean, even with pro boxing, when we started, we started with rock solid boxing promotions. Okay. That was back in the late nineties. Yes. And I got involved in, it. I was very naive and promptly lost a lot of money very, very quickly within two years, lost a ton of money. And almost cost me my marriage, almost cost me my house, almost cost me everything. So at that point, I almost said, to heck with it. Yeah. The roofing business is good to me. Let's just stick with it and not focus on the game because it's so unorthodox, unorthodox as a business. And so, yeah, there were times like that. Then there were a few times in my personal life when I faced with some personal stuff that I almost said, you know, to hell with it. But my father... And he's 87. He'll be 88 in March. That guy's, he's still the toughest guy I ever met in my life. If you want to have some fun and everybody that's listening, Google Google Nashville's Dirty Harry and you'll see a nice four minute uh, expose they did on my father in 2020 on the 50th anniversary of him getting shot five times by two thugs with a 38 when he was a cop and he lived to tell the tale. And the reason I say that because he is Nashville's Dirty Harry. And he's the strongest, toughest, smartest man I ever met in my life. So anytime I ever, and I tell dad this all the time, I say, pop, you're like right here. <laughs> you're like, get up, <laughs> don't stop, keep swinging, never surrender. So that's, that's been my mantra and it served me well. And um, I'll always feel that way. Uh, you only lose when you quit. 
You only lose when you surrender. Uh, and surrender is not an option. It's never an option. That's it. I agree with you, Joe. You know, uh, I'll share something that happened with me. Um, I worked late, you know, most evenings. Uh, it was a few months ago. I worked until 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. And on Thursdays, we have our boxing. We have kickboxing or we have boxing or we have uh, grappling. And mm -hmm. I, I felt so tired and I told myself, you know, maybe I shouldn't go to class today. I'm very, very tired. Like I can't keep my eyes open. They're burning. And you know me, I don't do that. I don't stay away from class. And I, got, I just go, you know, I went. And we're doing the kickboxing and I'm up against a guy and we start fighting. But I'm so tired, you know, my body feels oh. so heavy and my concentration is not there. And this guy just keeps pounding me. <laughs> in the face you know it's like seven oh, eight no. punches. i'm thinking in my mind what the heck is going on with me but i'm also thinking ah oh, you know i lost this one i'll be back tomorrow i'll be okay i'll just get some rest but i didn't keep i didn't go back i kept going forward because we're taught you don't go back you go forward you just keep going so i kept punching back i kept punching back and at one point i hooked him and i could see you know in the movies when it's slow motion you can see the face go, <laughs> and I knew yeah. that was a very hard punch. So I, and you know, then the the Kiyoshi stopped the fight, and now he's going to announce the winner. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, you know, I lost this one. And he lifted up both of our hands, and I looked at him and I said, and now, I mean, I clearly lost that fight. He said, yes, you he punched you more then you punched him but you kept going forward and that last he said if you gave him another hook like that he would have been out cold and that just taught me something you know sometimes life throws us punches in the face you know we're getting punched and pounded and and we want to step back but all that we have to do is keep stepping forward change our tactics and we'll get out of it okay and when you mentioned that quote about keep swinging never surrender I actually thought about that fight that I had. It had never happened to me before and since it hasn't happened. But uh, that was a good lesson. I learned a lot from you um, that day. You reminded me of that. Now, you also spoke about Mike Tyson, and I believe it was Trevon Burbick in November 22, 1986. Was that one of the fights that we discussed? Actually, actually no. Well, Mike Tyson, and I've got my, I was going to wear my hat today, custom auto. Um, who is a who is a, a guru when he was living he was one of the greatest trainers he was not only a trainer but he was also a psychologist with these guys and when Mike Tyson got in and he got adopted by custom auto up in the cat wow. cusp 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 was introduced to Mike Tyson by Bobby Stewart Bobby Stewart worked at the Tyron school for boys which was a next yeah five foot eight and 200 six grown men to take him down so bobby stewart mike wanted to get involved in the boxing at the tyrant school for boys and bobby stewart wasn't letting him because his bobby mike was he was grades weren't up to par he was getting in fights so he said you get your grades up and you start doing right and i'll bring you in well he brought him in and mike took over and in very short order Bobby Stewart was like, oh, my God, this guy needs to be up in the Catskills with Cuss. So he takes him and introduces him. Cuss took one look at him and knew that he had something very special. Now, you got to understand, Cuss Yamato, he had Floyd Patterson. Floyd Patterson was the first heavyweight champion to lose the title in the ring and win it back in the ring when he fought his trilogy um, in the late in 59 and 60. Not the great Joe Frazier. I mean, I'm sorry, not the great Joe Lewis, not the great Jack Johnson, not the not the great any fighter prior to him. Now, Floyd Patterson was a was a little fighter. He fought Ingemar Johansson, who was from Sweden, and he got knocked out in their first fight. Yeah. Ingemar knocked him out. <laughs> Floyd trained so hard with Cuss for the rematch that he almost killed the guy. He destroyed him in like three rounds in the rematch. Then they fought a rubber match oh and he destroyed him again. So Floyd, who was a really small heavyweight, he was like 185, 182 pounds, but there's no limit for heavyweight. And you got to remember back then, we didn't have a cruiserweight. You went from 175 up to heavyweight. 
So mm. when 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 Cus trained him to regain the title, the first time it had ever happened in the history of boxing, that's a really great accomplishment because there's a lot of great fighters. I mean, Jack Dempsey couldn't pull it off. That was a great accomplishment. Yeah. So they had to fight Sonny Liston. And this is the whole point of the story. When Sonny Liston fought uh -huh. Roy Patterson, he destroyed him in one round, 90 seconds, 92 seconds. Oh. He already knew it was a four. So he could slip out. He got destroyed one second quicker in the rematch. So after that fight, Customato was on a mission to find him his version of Sonny Liston because make no mistake, Sonny Liston was a great heavyweight. He was a bad man. And for Al, for yeah. Cassius Clay at the time to beat him like he did, that was unheard of. So yeah. Sonny, Sonny Liston inspired Cus to find him a monster like that. And when he met Mike, when Mike was about 12 or 13, I think he was 12, he knew he had something. They started training. Teddy Atlas was one of the first trainers up there in the Catskills. And very quickly, he they knew they had something special. And when Mike fought Trevor Burbick for the heavyweight championship, November 22nd, yeah. 1986, and he dropped the guy three times with one punch in the second round. And if Mills Lane did not catch Trevor Burbick, Burbick would have gone down four times from one punch. It was actually a right hook body shot and then a left hook up top. And if you watch the replay, he goes down, he gets up, he goes down, he gets up, he goes down, he gets up, and Mills Lane catches this guy. And there's not a fighter, not the great Rocky Marciano, not the great Joe Lewis, not the great Jack Johnson, not the great Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, nobody on that night, November 22nd, 1986, there's not a fighter that ever will live or ever has lived that would have beat that man. Mike Tyson yeah. was the perfect fighting machine. And my dad even said to me, he goes, Joe, the only guy that's going to beat him is Mike Tyson. And that's what happened. And I love mm -hmm. Mike Tyson because he is a very intelligent guy. He's very yeah. effective. And I, he was very angry. And have you ever seen his HBO special uh, where he did the one man show, Mike Tyson, Undisputed Truth? Have you ever seen it? Not yet, not yet. I'm definitely gonna look for it. This is this is an HBO special. It came out several years ago. They've got yeah. two of them. The first one though is so great. Mike Tyson is so honest. He tells the truth about his whole yeah. life. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. tell you, you'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll cheer for this guy when you watch this one man show. And he is a funny guy. Yeah. The funniest thing in the whole series when he talks about him and Mitch Blood Green getting a fight in Harlem at Dapper Dan's boutique at three o'clock in the morning. And when he tells that story, <laughs> you'll be rolling, you'll be rolling on the floor. It's, it's crazy, but I'm a big fan of Mike Tyson. Yeah. He was a very misunderstood, yeah. misguided youth. He fell back into his old ways mm -hmm. when Cuss died. Yeah. Biggest honors I ever had and probably will be up there in the top three forever. In 2015, I was afforded the opportunity to play host for the 30th anniversary of the passing of Cuss at Catskill, at Cuss's KO uh, gym in the Catskills, New York. And I got to be the host for three hours, honoring the man and talking about his career, talking about Mike, talking about all the things that they do for the youth there. And it's it's still probably one of my proudest moments ever. Fantastic, fantastic. I agree with you. I absolutely agree. I love Mike Tyson. He is, he's absolutely incredible. Incredible human being, incredible athlete as well. And his legacy, you know, he's going to leave a wonderful legacy one day. And I wanted to ask you about your shirt, Matt. I mean, you've got such a nice shirt on. We talked about that before the show. Sure. Tell us about Rock Solid Combat Sports. Yay! Well, as I was telling you, we started in the late 90s as Rock Solid Boxing. And then we transitioned. So we've got the the three main disciplines: boxing, bare knuckle, and MMA. And so it just it just morphed into going from promotions where I almost lost a bunch of money to managing fighters and help fighters get fights and making sure they're treated right, reviewing the contracts for them, make sure they're in a situation where it's positive for them. And you know that's yeah. that's one of the main things about the sport of combat sports, whether it's boxing or MMA or bare knuckle, that 
you know, a lot of these guys, they need the right people around them that are looking out for their best mm -hmm. interest. And unfortunately, yes. sometimes promoters and managers are not really looking out for the fighter's best interest. They're just wanting to put asses in the seats and make money. And if it's a bloodbath and, you know, you lose, it doesn't matter to them. Um, so yeah. Rock Solid Combat Sports has evolved. We're going to be the management arm for our gym, Intensity Fighting Gym in Indiana. And we're also have Intensity combat sports rock Yay. solid combat sports management is going to help manage the fighters on the bare knuckle side we've got hector camacho jr my very good friend and a very fine fighter and he's going to be in That's charge good. of training the boxing side of things and uh, of course kevin and i are going to be heading up to bare knuckle with byb and the trigon and we've got several masters that want to be involved in the mma side of things i've got my very good friend shannon the cannon rich eight-time MMA world champion. He has more fights. He and Dan Severn have more fights than any fighter that's ever lived. They have over 200 fights each. Oh, so wow. he's going to be helping us as well. Yeah, and then, and then we also have a former manager of Lou Ferrigno's. He is wanting to be involved with the bodybuilding side because this facility is 16,000 square feet. So we're going to have weight training facility. We're going to have the bare knuckle facility and then the mats for the MMA. And then we're going to have a, a real boxing gym in there. The only people that are going to be going into the Trigon, though, are the professional bare knuckle fighters, because this is not where you start. You don't start in bare knuckle. Mm -hmm. And there's another organization that's doing something that I don't really agree with. They're calling it amateur bare knuckle. I don't agree with it because I think amateur bare knuckle is the golden gloves. You learn to box. You don't start trying to learn to fight bare knuckle, because if you get in there with a skilled fighter, somebody that's been doing this for a while and you're just mm -hmm. a street tough. Oh, you're gonna get you're gonna get tore up in very short order. So, the the yeah. whole concept of what we're doing with Rock Solid and with Intensity Fighting, as you know, Kevin Oliver's organizations in 2021 yes. tragically, he lost his two sons, one to gun violence yes. and one to fentanyl. So mm -hmm. we're we're wanting to stop fentanyl and wanting to stop gun violence. And what we're gonna do that is give these kids an option instead of getting involved with street gangs and getting involved with street violence. Come to the gym and we'll teach you how to be a real fighter. Yeah. And you can channel your energies into this. And, and it's even bigger than just the fighting part. There's a lot of things that we want to do with intensity yes. that's still going to play out in 2024. But we're very excited about it. I'm very honored and proud to be partnered with Kevin Oliver and with Hector Camacho Jr. And I can guarantee you it's the only gym in the world with a Trigon. The only gym in the world. And we're sponsored by BYB. So thank you to Mike Vasquez. Thank you to Mike, uh, to Greg Bloom. Thank you to Mill Valenzuela. To me, it's the finest organization. And I've been involved with all of them, but I really do believe yeah. in BYB Extreme Fighting Series. I believe in the Trigon. Quite honestly, I thought it was a gimmick. I thought a Trigon. Miami met my. Oh my goodness! This is not a gimmick. This is almost like a phone booth. This is going to force the action. And Dada Five Thousand, who started this in two thousand seven in the backyard, he was the guy that came up with the Trigon. And I'm mm -hmm. honored to have him and say he's my friend. We, we talk regularly. And this whole thing is about to really take off. The next, in 2024 is really gonna be a seminal year for BYB, for Bare Knuckle, and for Intensity Fighting Gym. And Rock Solid Combat Sports. Absolutely. Yay, and yes, absolutely. And Rock Solid Combat Sports. I love the fact that everyone comes together to make this vision work. Shout out to Kevin Oliver, Hector, Macho, Camacho, my wonderful friends, Joe. You are, uh, you know, partnered up with them. You guys are doing amazing things out there. This is a huge project and it's going to have such a positive effect, you know, on the people that are involved, especially the way that it's being approached, the way that you are putting it together. I know there's going to be facilities in different parts of America. I know the one, I believe, is going to be in New York. Um, New York City, baby. The down New York City. Uh, the, the, glove, the gloves up and the guns down. That initiative and stopping fentanyl. I mean, this is going to have a very, this project is going to have a very far and lasting reach. So I can feel the excitement and I can see the vision and we cheer you guys on. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited to hear about it. I want to ask you, you know, um, 
lessons that you've learned in your journey. You had a father that really taught you to never, never stop swinging and to never surrender. And you've seen and lived through all these experiences. What's like one of the lessons that you've learned in your life that that's really spoken to you on a personal and a professional level, something that really touched your heart? Well, and you know what? It's very easy to say because my father, who is the largest and biggest influence in my life, you know, I, I love all pro sports. Yeah. I'm a I'm a huge college football fan. I'm a Tennessee volunteer. I love college football. I love football. I love boxing. I love bare knuckle. I love MMA. I love the UFC. But my father is the only hero I ever had. I, I never looked up to the athletes like I look up to my father. My father is the mm -hmm. strongest, toughest man I ever met. And at almost 80, he'll be 88 in March. He's still the strongest, toughest man I ever met. And the good news is his brain is sharp as a tack. But he used to tell me, Juanita, he would say, Joe, I'm your biggest fan. You're my number one born son. You're my namesake. Mm -hmm. I love you. Yeah. And I'm going to always be here for you. But there's going to be a day when I'm not going to be here anymore. So I want you to know this. Yeah. I've instilled upon you all of the morals, the values, the strength, the work ethic that you need to be successful. So I want you to remember this right now. Remember this. It's a very simple statement. It's 10 two-letter words, 20 letters, and it goes like this. If it is to yeah. be, it is up to me. And he mm -hmm. said, when you look in the mirror every morning, when you get around, know that you're a champion and know that anything that comes your way, you will overcome it because I'm telling you that. So mm -hmm. if it is to be, it is up to me. And I love that. It's a very simple statement, but it's true. So he says, don't depend on anybody to get anything done for yourself. Do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's exceptional. And it's speaking to the audience, Joe. It's speaking to the audience. And you know, you knocked that question right out. And this has been a phenomenal time with you. Thank you so much. I, I absolutely enjoy talking with you. And yes, I cheer you on, really. And it's going to stay in my mind. Keep swinging. Never surrender. That really made an impression on me. And is there anything you want to leave the audience with today? You know, something that you want to just put in their hearts, maybe shout outs you want to do? Sure. Um, for anybody that's listening, if you're going through something really tough, just remember this, and this, a lot of people know this saying, but it's true. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. And whatever you're facing right now, this too will pass. Just don't ever give up on yourself. Don't stop reaching for the stars, okay? Shoot for the moon. That way, if you land on a mountaintop, you're still successful. But never stop believing yourself. Be your own biggest fan. Because if you don't believe and love yourself, how can you believe and love anybody else? So the shout out I want to give, though, is to my partners, Kevin and Hector. Uh, our our foundations, Kevin's got a uh, Hector's got a foundation. And of course, Kevin's got the two foundations, gloves up, guns down and stopping fentanyl. Those are very, very important causes. And that's really the driving force behind what we're doing. The gym, yes. bare knuckle is all a vehicle to bring the awareness up. And it's a vehicle that we're going to use that's going to pull people out of situations that they're in that they might not think that they can get out of. We're going to show them an avenue to get out of it. But if 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 everybody leaves anything, just know that whatever you're up against, don't ever, ever think that this is the end. It's never the end. There's always tomorrow. There's a brighter day coming. And keep swinging and never surrender. I love that. Absolutely agree with you. You have inspired me so much, Joe. Thank you. The audience, you know, there's so many golden nuggets that you that you have shared today. And audience, this was an amazing interview with the one and only psycho Joe Mack. And uh, thank you so much, Joe. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> we'll thank you so much. It was a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Have a beautiful day. Bye. You too, darling. Bye. Bye.